I hear all the time that it is too late to start a niche site <laughs> or blogging is dying. Um, all the good topics are taken and I hear it all the time and when I say all the time, I mean like really all the time. Like every day. Like since I started. For over six years people have been telling me it's too late and yet we start, in the last year we started over a dozen mm -hmm. new blogs yeah. and new niche sites. So um, not dead. In fact, what we're seeing is the exact opposite. I actually believe that 2022 presents one of the best opportunities for bloggers, even people just getting started, that we've seen before. And so today we wanna to show you why and show you how you can take advantage of that yourself. All right, today we actually are here live. <laughs> um, and we are gonna be taking questions, but first we have some things that we've mm -hmm. prepared that uh, we're excited to share with you. So we're gonna jump right into that. Okay, so there are three main things that we kind of identified. Well, they're very overarching. Yeah. They're very, very large categories. <laughs> There's so many opportunities for bloggers today, I think, mm -hmm. but yeah, we've tried to narrow it down to three big ones. Yeah, so the first one is monetization opportunities. Yeah. There's some big things going on with this one. Some huge things, and really, like, again, I think better than ever. So the first thing that is happening right now and that's been happening recently is that bloggers are able to get ads on their site, premium ads on their site, Huge. sooner than ever. So this year, Azoic announced that um, they're working with people from the beginning. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we started this with Project 24 members. They were working with us um, to be able to get ads on Project 24 member sites. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning, they saw that actually that model works. Yeah. They could do it at scale. And so that's what they've been doing. And, I, and they're getting better and better and better at it. So. Um, you can start monetizing your, your site earlier than ever before. Yeah. I think that's big. Yeah, I think it's really cool that there, there becomes multiple opportunities to make money in your first month, two months, three months, <laughs> yeah, four months. seriously. It's huge. Uh, I see a couple people commenting here real quick. Uh, yep. Hey, Jonathan, uh, Brent. I feel like I see a couple other you guys. Thanks for joining. It's good to see you. Yep. Thanks for being here. All right. And so that's number one, right? Mm -hmm. Just being able to get ads on your site right away. Um, just a few years ago, we basically didn't do ads. Yeah. We were like affiliate, uh, maybe info products and stuff, but mostly um, not ads. Mm -hmm. Ads has just added this huge new revenue stream that's even more passive than affiliate. But the opportunities with affiliate are getting better yes. as well. Um, what COVID did to us uh, worldwide, mm -hmm. it shut people up, it put people indoors, and it kept us out of the stores. Yeah. And so people's buying behavior is changing more and more and more. And there's more commerce being done on the web than ever before. Yeah. Um, people are, are buying not only physical products, but even information products, mm -hmm. I think, substantially more than they were before. And I think one thing that's important to recognize about that is it's not just Amazon. Right. You know, a couple of years ago, it was 100% Amazon. That was just like your go-to affiliate. But now people are getting more comfortable shopping off of on, Amazon. Off of, yeah, off of yeah. their platform on tons of other platforms where two, three years ago, you wouldn't want to enter your credit card information. I mean, yeah. there's even like, there's, you know, there's more safety and security features that are all over the web now mm -hmm. to protect buyers, which makes it great for us. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, people are much more comfortable paying across the web, totally yeah. off across the web. You're able to use your Apple Pay, your Google Pay, mm -hmm. et cetera. You're able to use even Amazon Pay mm -hmm. all across the yeah. web. You can, um, a lot of uh, sites will take cryptocurrency now um, as a payment method. And so your information is much more secure, yep. but also we have these s several other third-party platforms that are providing not only payment, but like, um, you know, shipment tracking. Right. There's like the right. shop, yes. um, there's several others. And so again, people are like, yeah, I can get free shipping no matter mm -hmm. where I go. Right. Walmart offers me two day shipping now yep. on things. Yep. And so people are shopping elsewhere, which is fantastic because conversion rates on Amazon have been notoriously been very high. <clears throat> but their commissions have been just right. <laughs> dropping and dropping and dropping. Yeah. And so as that happens, we can now have success outside. Yeah. I think, and then you mentioned when we were chatting about this yesterday, a survey where people said that they will trust an online review just as much as they'll trust like a recommendation from a friend. Yeah, something around over the, there've been several surveys I found over the, just the last several years um, where it seems like about 80% of mm -hmm. shoppers say that basically before any purchase, they'll look at reviews, whether that yeah. be reviews on the product page itself, yeah. which is a big part of it, yeah. but also just um, reviews on the web. 
the thing is though that consumers are getting savvy and so some of these really like spammy crummy reviews that we see on blogs are not cutting it anymore but that that is that is really mm -hmm. cool that people are like yeah if i have a friend that i know knows about this and i go ask them and they tell me what to buy i'm about just as trusting right. at, of a stranger right. yep. who reviews the product online, yep. especially if I know they actually yeah. have the product and mm -hmm. they've used it before. Yeah, definitely. I'm seeing a lot of comments come in. Uh, hey, everybody, good to see ya. Um, as you might, I think the text is still on the screen there. We are going to be taking questions in a little bit. We just we, we talked about some really cool things yesterday that we wanted to share. Yeah, before absolutely. We those, so. Yep, but yeah. I am taking note of a couple of these questions that yes, I think are really definitely. really fitting. Okay, so the second big thing that we found, or that we think that for 2022 is just going to be huge for internet marketers is low competition. <laughs> now, as we talked about this one, we were like, okay, we might get a little backlash for this, but no, hear us out. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so first of all, um, we, we need to talk about barriers to entry. Yes. So barriers to entry, I mean, in any business or in, really in anything, these are the things that prevent just everyone from doing it, right? Um, internet marketing is not that expensive to get into. That's a very low barrier to entry. I mean, pay for hosting, a few dollars a month, and maybe a WordPress theme, maybe a logo, a couple things, but really you can, it can be done very cheaply. And the, what the work is, is just the sweat equity. Right. So the competition has just been fierce for years and years and years, and it's only been getting worse. But the last couple of years, we've seen this like marked shift, not, not necessarily in the behavior of bloggers, but in the capability of the search engines mm -hmm. to weed out the trash, yeah. which has created actually a high barrier to entry, yeah. I think, for new people. Yeah, um, I I see comments all the time. Um, in fact, I just did a poll um, on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you don't see those, by the way, check out the community tab. I've been doing um, mm -hmm. about one a week. It's been really interesting, um, and I've seen several comments of people who are just like, ah, "It's too late. It's too hard. It's too saturated, etc." And because the question I asked was like, "Why haven't you started your blog yet?" If you haven't. Mm -hmm. And those were the, you know, I was getting that a lot. Like, it's right. just too saturated. Right. It's too hard. There's too many people. Yeah, okay. So, I, and here's the reason why we think it's not the case. So, you mentioned that Google's getting better at removing the spam. So, what we're left with is higher quality content, yep. but fewer pieces of, fewer pieces of content overall. And so, that gives us, who are going to be teaching and, and learning and sharing really high quality content, that gives us a place where we can actually dominate the search engine ranking page. It is such an awesome opportunity. Um, we were looking at a graph, yeah, I think, Yeah, so yesterday. I'm pulling up here. Um, Not this one, and but this it, other one. This graph that we were looking at shows something really, really cool. This There's a little spike here at the <laughs> end that is just so interesting. So this, you can see here on the screen, like this little spike here over the end. Look at us getting fancy, going doing a screen share in a live. Um, no, all right, so this spike coincides with Google's latest algorithm update. What this chart is showing is the at least for the you know the searches that that Moz is tracking specifically, um, how many of those searches um, are you know dominated or at least represent are showing mm -hmm. the top ten websites on the web, right? So what they what they're looking at is like the ten websites that show up the most often. Mm -hmm. How often are they showing up? And you know, a week ago. 0.15% of the time. Now, 0.16% of the time. And a sudden shift. Why would that be? And why would we be okay with that? Because it's like, you know, does, does that mean that you have to be a massive website to succeed? And, and no, that's, I don't think that's what this shows. I don't think that this is necessarily showing that you have to be the biggest authority. Mm -hmm. I think what it's showing is that overall, fewer sites are making up more of the search results. Yes. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean only authoritative sites. Mm -hmm. It means that there are, I think there are so many blogs because for so many years you could do that. You could rip other people off. Mm -hmm. You could create trashy, just one page websites, um, with, uh, like hundreds of backlinks that you bought, um, or just, you know, created through black hat spammy means. Mm -hmm. And then you could get traffic Yeah, and it stopped working. Yeah. And you don't even just have to take our word for it. Like we're seeing it. Yeah. So the other day we were, I was in a group with some Project Twenty Four members, and there were a couple people in the group who said, you know, two, three, five years ago, this is what they were doing. 
They had over a thousand sites. They were just spammy because that Do you worked. imagine managing a thousand sites can you, I can't and doing even, it right? No, I can't even imagine. <laughs> can't be done. But they said that it just stopped working. It yeah. is just over time, it has progressively gotten worse and worse. And there was one who said they even saw all their rankings being stolen by Project 24 members. So there's just like, there's this quality. Yeah. It's quality content. It has the user in mind. It's just that is the way that things are moving. Exactly. It's going in that direction, and I don't think that it's going to stop doing that. So what this does is it creates this huge barrier to entry. So not only have we taken a whole ton of spammy sites that just no value, no, con mm -hmm. no, just nothing of substance there, and we're removing them from the yeah. serfs, deprioritizing them, right. as, as I'll say. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're they're just not ranking the way that they were, and they're losing their traffic, and so more traffic is going to legitimate content. But what that means is this is also no longer just this easy game for um, again for just these trashy mm -hmm. sites to come in, and so people will stop doing it. That's the way that behavior yep. is. Yep. If it doesn't work, people are going to stop doing it. Yep. And so new high barrier to entry, it's kind of like the ghost town phase of a blog, yeah. which is another massive barrier to entry that's been there, yes. um, which is just when you create content and it just takes several months for Google to start to pick it up. This is really cool, though, because we're mm -hmm. still seeing it work. Um, Cook for Folks is a site that we've talked about publicly yep. on this channel, so I'm happy to continue to reveal it. Um, and that is a, a website that... We first started having content for Google to index in January. Yep. So we're not at a year yet, and we've hit the hockey stick. Yeah. And so we just saw this really, really, really slow growth. And then for the last month or so, it's just been, it's been ticking up really nice. Ticking up <laughs> at this, it, it, we, it's a hockey stick shape because the growth becomes exponential mm -hmm. until it tends to level out at some point up higher later. So very exciting. The competition really is effectively lower. Yeah. Even if there still are millions of spammy bloggers, mm -hmm. their content is failing. Yeah. And the people that are doing it this way, the Project 24 way, are generally not seeing the same yeah. sort of impact. Um, certainly, Project 24 sites sometimes get hit in algorithm updates. It happens. Mm -hmm. um, it's totally outside of our control. I, 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 sorry, I got to add this. This is my you know, tinfoil hat moment. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm kind of taking that. There's a Project 24 member who said the same thing in the community the other day, you know, put on my tinfoil hat. It looked, it seems like every year, right around this time, when Google pushes out their algorithm update during the holiday season, the shopping season, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, all the major retail sites seem to get a bump in traffic. <laughs> um, and then, it, and then for some reason, it, it levels out again after Christmas. Mm. Um, so... <laughs> We'll just leave that there. Um, <laughs> but sites are still making a lot yeah. of really, really great money this time of yeah. year. Um, ours, uh, we yeah. didn't even see, I didn't see a blip. Nope. Well, and I think not only that, not only are they still making money, but it's still a great time to get in. It is. I mean, like you said, in the past year, we've built over a dozen sites. Yeah. Um, and they're all growing. Everyone. So you just can't say that there's not a way to get in right now. Okay, so the third thing that we identified, and this, I have to admit, might be the one that I'm probably uh, most excited about. Yeah. Um, there are some opportunities with what we are calling superior formats. Yeah. Um, there are some really, really cool opportunities coming. Um, Google updates, I think, that are going to impact this. Um, that where right now, of course, blogging, you know, writing, um, blog posts, images, all those are great. But there are some other formats that we're seeing just pick up and kick up some huge yeah. traction for blogs. So Google's updates tend to benefit the most, mm -hmm. um, Google. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> and so as we see the, their search experience starting to, you know, mold over time and it has mm -hmm. been for a long time, um, you know, the rich snippets and stuff, uh, they, they benefit Google. Yep. we what do we do? We find a way to take advantage of that right. and use them to get more traffic more quickly. Well, right now we're also seeing Google. Um, and again, I say starting to see, but no, it's, this is the writing's been on the wall for mm -hmm. a couple of years. Um, surfacing more YouTube videos in, directly in the search yeah. results. Video is becoming a, a key place to send people. And I have to admit, there are a lot of search queries where the visual format mm -hmm. is better. It's yeah. a better result. Yeah. If I'm asking a question, how to, how to stain a fence, how to pressure wash a driveway, I'm sorry, an article doesn't do the same right. as a video. And so if there's a video that shows explicitly how to do that thing, yep. It's better, but it's also better for Google because they keep people on a platform they conveniently own, yep. <laughs> known as YouTube. And so 
there are really two different um, approaches that you can take to YouTube as a blogger. And the first one I think is going to be the most popular for bloggers because you're not building a, a YouTube following. Right. You're not creating a channel that requires you to publish one or two videos every single week. Mm -hmm. You're actually just creating a channel just like you would create a blog and having it as a place to put video content that is very search focused. Right. That's what we're going for. Yeah, and I think that when you, rather than thinking of it, oh, becoming like a YouTube influencer, you're really using YouTube or whatever video hosting you're using, really. Right. You're using it as a tool to build your website. Right. You know, it's it's like, it's just a tool in your tool belt. It's not necessarily saying you have to become something else, yeah. like become a YouTuber. That's not the case. And we've done that multiple times where mm -hmm. we build a channel or put up a channel with 5, 10, 15 videos that just do some great things to our blog traffic. It is amazing. I mean, when we built Camper Report, yeah. we had a channel with about 10 videos on it. That was it. I mean, yep. and they were like, Jim set up his cell phone, yes. sat in a camper, and talked about a topic, just yeah. answering a specific yep. question. Those videos did well back then just in YouTube search. Right. Now they would do really well even in just search. Yeah. And But that, that those videos drove considerable traffic yeah. to the website, built it up much faster. Yep. So that's what we're suggesting is, Keep your blogger hat on, yes. just make a video yes. that covers the same information, but show when rather than tell. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we create supplemental content on the blog. So we want the video to be, um, to be able to stand on its own, um, answer the search query completely in the video, but still have additional helpful resources. Right. So if it's a how-to blog post, a tools and materials list, um, the steps written out as a reference guide, um, that sort of thing is really helpful mm -hmm. and you can direct people to that from the video But then you also embed the video in the blog post and so no matter how people find that content They're getting the best experience possible. Yeah. Here's the other cool thing about video Nobody can scrape and spin <laughs> your content yeah. on a blog post people are doing that yeah. um, They'll 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 just spin an article you took the time to research and and it's it's you can't fake it on Yeah, video. and I think something else that's really important with YouTube is obviously that huge benefit that you just can't steal someone else's face. I mean, yeah. you just can't currently anyway, but there's also built in trust. Um, when you're Absolutely. on YouTube, it's a great place to review products. It's a great place to actually build some rapport with an audience. So even if your goal isn't to become a YouTuber, people who find you on YouTube are going to be more connected to your brand Absolutely. than they would if they had found you through your website. So when you transition them to your site, there's a good chance that they could actually be returning visitors when typically we don't really have returning visitors and really don't care if we have returning visitors. And honestly, it's yeah, I think you're gonna see much higher conversions mm -hmm. on your affiliate yes. recommendations, especially like for your own info products, yeah. but even on affiliate, like. There's just a different level of trust and engagement you get with video. You just, that is really hard to get in a written format. Um, taking lots of your own photos is really good for a blog. Um, I think that's pretty key as well and makes it also harder for other people to steal and make their content outrank yours. Mm -hmm. um, but a video just takes that, you know, five steps further. Yep. The other thing is that we have seen over and over and over again that Google indexes and ranks yes. video <laughs> Our light just turned off. We're sitting too That's still. all right. <laughs> but at least this light's still on. Um, Google indexes and ranks video content very quickly. Yeah. You put up a brand new video on a brand new channel and still within a matter of hours, yeah. not months, yeah. weeks, or even days, but within a matter of hours, you can type in a search in, on YouTube at least and have that video mm -hmm. show up. And then you can type in a search on Google, and we've seen this within a matter of a couple of days even, yep. on a brand new channel and website where that video is already ranking on the first page of Google search, right? right. getting traffic. Right. Whereas a brand new blog, you're talking yep. about months. Yep. Um, and so, and the same I think is true for um, when you have a more established channel versus a more established blog. Mm -hmm. you, you can put up an article on a well-established blog, and it can be up in hours, but, um, I mean, just on average, it's just yeah. going to be so much faster. Okay, so if you're a brand new blogger, what do you do with this? Yeah. Well, I, if it was me, mm. it is me, actually. Yeah. I put up five, ten videos on a, on a channel pretty early on um, because what the potential is, is that I could drive early traffic yeah. from those videos to my website. <laughs> and if Google starts seeing you getting some traffic that way, I mean, that's a perfectly above, I mean, that's totally That is cool. like white hat. That's white hat. I mean, 100%. You can totally do that Organic. because 
you're providing value. Yeah. You know, it, there's nothing scammy or spammy about it. You're providing value to a visitor and then providing them extra value on the website. I mean, you're going the whole nine yards. Yeah, absolutely. I did say there were two approaches to YouTube. The other one is building a brand, yes. building a channel, a following. Now, as bloggers, if you've gotten to the point where like you're going full time with your blog and stuff, mm -hmm. man, I've, if, if, if you wanna build it into a brand, YouTube is a great place to do it. Yep. And I think you can take a channel where you've done search videos like this before, and that's fine, and that's kind of the foundational content, and you can take that new strategy, but it's so, so different than blogging. The types of videos you make, the, just the whole mentality of it, the way you create content is very different. If you go into that with a blogging mindset, you're gonna spend months spinning your wheels. Yeah. Um, but it's a fantastic way to build a brand. We've interviewed even on this channel, yeah. members of Project 24 who even, I'm thinking of one in particular who we interviewed about a year and a half ago and he was just doing awesome back then, hit full-time mm -hmm. income. And now he's doing multiples. Multiple times. Of what he was earning yeah. then. Um, just from a YouTube channel and a blog. Right. One YouTube channel paired with a blog. Yep. Um, and that's something that you can do when you start to build that influence and that authority and that rapport yep. on a YouTube channel. So it is a different skill set. Some people find that they love video even more than mm -hmm. writing. Um, if that's something you want to learn, we just launched, I'm going to show you guys this, in Project 24. Um, this is the coolest thing. Um, we launched, we were working with, if any of you have been following us uh, closely in um, kind of the whole business, sorry, let me find the right one. Um, you've probably heard of Channel Makers, it's another YouTube channel, um, and uh, Nate on Channel Makers. Nate's awesome, Nate is part of our team, we're part of his team, we all work together, and uh, Nate has been working really hard on this new, I would call it a course, but it's not a course, it's, the YouTube yeah. system. Yes. So here in Project 24, I mean, we have loads and loads of courses, right? Well, the YouTube system, that's Nate right there, and it's right here across the top is one of our two sort of flagship main um, courses. Mm -hmm. This is just incredible. So it has seven phases, and the phases are meant to help you no matter where you are on your YouTube journey to, um, to know exactly what to do next, right? So, you know, there's a roadmap for every phase that shows you exactly how this phase works and how to work through it, and at what point you're ready to graduate from the phase. Um, so, you know, phase, phase one is more, is a phase that you come back to regularly mm -hmm. to reevaluate where you are, what your channel is and what you want it to be. It's kind of like revisiting your search analysis right. and battleshipping and everything right. kind of all in one. Um, you know, in phase two, you're learning the basic skills. A lot of people are going to be able to jump through or past phase two really quickly um, if they've been doing YouTube already. Yep. But then phase three is where it really picks up and nobody should skip phase three. Um, you should work through every single step. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think it's fantastic. I'm really excited to actually do, um, basically take the same approach for the blogging course. Yes. Right now it's a course. It will soon be a system like this that's yeah. just designed um, and built in a better way to help people to, uh, again, just kind of work through on their site mm -hmm. and just grow it and grow it and grow it. Something that I love about the YouTube system, just really quick, Nate has put so many really cool resources, tools in there to help you plan out, yeah. to you validate your channel. Um, so many opportunities, but one thing that I really, really love is, you know, people along their journey, you're gonna get stuck sometimes. Um, and so we've planned mastermind group meetings for yeah. people in each phase who are struggling with the, the graduation requirements. And so, you know, every month or two times a month, we're gonna meet with those people specifically and we're gonna be able to help them and say, hey, here's what we would recommend, do A, B, and C. Go off two weeks later or a month later, you're gonna be able to see if you've made the progress. If not, come back to the mastermind. And we're gonna be able yeah. to get, like, work you through the steps. And so you're not, it's not like you're just gonna be floundering on your own. I mean, Never. I think that to me that is so much value. Like as, as myself wanting to build another YouTube channel, I think I would love that. Yeah, some absolutely. validation on my, on my work. And really like, I have to really credit Anna. Mm -hmm. She's yes. like, Okay, so Anna, inside Project 24, if you're in there, you you see Anna all the mm -hmm. time, right? Um, Anna puts on the masterminds. We yes. participate, we run them, yeah. um, but she schedules them. She knows, she 
talks to all the members. She knows exactly yeah. what they need. When people join Project 24, like every week she's doing a mastermind for new members. Yes. Um, she does masterminds for women in blogging. Mm -hmm. um, it just because it's just kind of a different um, approach, different mentality. A lot of people are coming from a blogging background. They've been doing it for a while, but their style's different and their approach has been right. different. Um, and so just like so much that she's doing there. And so she's coordinating all of these and has been for mm -hmm. several months. Yeah, the masterminds, right. I think, have been a game changer for the they're people that right. are taking advantage of those. Um, another thing that I hear frequently, I, I got to bring this up. And then we are getting to your questions right now, um, right after this. I get this all the time. Um, thank you for your YouTube content. I love it. Which you're welcome, by the way. That's why we do this. Um, I, I thank you for your YouTube uh, stuff. It, it's so helpful. I'm I'm working hard on my blog, and someday I'll be able to afford Project Twenty Four once I make enough for my blog, and then I plan to join. Which I admire. I would probably take the same approach myself. Yeah. I am a save up for it and then yeah. buy it kind of person. I would never recommend going into debt to buy. Um, I guess people go into debt for college all the time, but I didn't even do that, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, just not something that I would do. Um, and the problem with that, though, is the hardest part of blogging is that ghost town phase. Yeah. And you don't earn anything. And so you spend months and months and months, and you don't even know if you did it right. And so I get people all the time that are like, can you just look over my site and tell me if I'm doing the right thing so that I don't waste, you know, months mm -hmm. uh, with bad content? And I'm like... I, I, I'm only one person. Yeah. We're two people, right? We can't do that for everybody. But Project 24 does that for you. That's yeah. why we created it. And that's why we keep the price so low. I, I look in our industry and I see so many people charging $1,000 yep. for their course. They're like one course. And Project 24 is our entire system of everything. It includes the YouTube stuff. Somebody just asked how much are the masterminds. Uh, they're yeah. part of Project 24. Yeah. There like, is not a single upsell. The only thing is, if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching help at some point, then once you're to a point where like, we say, okay, yeah, a little bit of direction would, would really mm -hmm. go a long way for you, then it's like, okay, yeah, we'll consider it. Nate's, mm -hmm. Nate's offering that. Um, we, I'm, I may start offering that again as well yeah. on the blogging side. But beyond that, like, there's not, and that's not even an upsell. That's no. like a, okay, fine, if you insist, I guess I'll let you pay right. me to help you on your website. Yeah. And those are usually people that are already earning good money and just trying to figure out how to take it to the next level. Yeah. All right, I do want to get to your questions now. So um, <laughs> here we go. Um, all right. Did you see one already, Nathan? Did um, I, did, I, I just saw the one about the masterminds. Other than that, I hadn't had a chance to look at any yet. <laughs> Okay, so we get questions a lot about, is this a good niche? Is this a good niche? And I'm saying niche right now. I think I'm just going to own the yeah. word. I'm just, people are like, it's niche. Like, <laughs> uh, you know what? For a hundred years, English speaker, speakers have been saying niche. And it's okay yes, it's all right. to pronounce a word that you've appropriated from another language because mm -hmm. it is French. Yep. And in French, it is niche. Yep. And that's okay. But I'm sorry, British speaking, like proper British speaking people have been saying niche for a hundred years. And I think it's okay for Americans. It's not just rednecks, guys. It's, it's people all around the world have been saying niche for a long time. And so to me, I like it better, niche. Okay, but I get this question all the time. Is, is XYZ a good niche? Is intermittent fasting a good niche? So there are really just a few guidelines I'd give you on selecting a niche. I just said niche. Um, it's, it's, it's both. Niche. <laughs> they're, they're both correct. Look in a dictionary. Both pronunciations are there. Okay. Um, really, there's just a few criteria. For me, the first criterion is, do I like it? Mm -hmm. Would it be something I would be interested in, like, blogging about for a long time, for years, right. and not get tired of it? Intermittent fasting um, falls into a category of nutrition, which falls into a category of health and fitness which is very saturated with bloggers. If you think about it, what most bloggers from the beginning got into were things like um, moms raising, you know, having babies and raising kids, um, nutrition and fitness. Yep. Um, though, I mean, those are some of the, I think, big ones that travel is another one. Mm -hmm. That's like every blogger wants to be one of those three things. And then um, there's the health and wellness stuff that is more medical that it's not that it's oversaturated, it's just that it's really competitive with a few big players 
who have all the authority. But here's the thing. If it's something you're willing to go all in on, mm -hmm. then yes, you can yeah. do it. But you have to be willing to go all in on it, which means you probably shouldn't just pick something out of the blue. You should pick something that you're willing to go all in on. Um, if you are willing to take the topic a step further, um, if you're willing to go on YouTube in particular, uh, then yes, even some of the most competitive niches mm -hmm. um, can be done. But that one is going to be tough. Yep. Okay, more questions here. <clears throat> we got new ones coming in now. Oh, here we go. Um, oh, how much money can I sell my website for? Um, I think that's a cool question. That's actually one of the course. We have a course roadmap in Project 24 yeah. of courses that we have recently planned and put out. We just put out an affiliate course, affiliate marketing course, um, of course, the YouTube system. But this one is actually on our list. Um, it is. We buy and sell websites fairly frequently, and we've learned a lot about it. Um, but as far as simply valuate, like valuing a site, um, it can, it really, there's quite a large range. I've seen them sell as low as 20x. Um, so it's, you, it's a multiple, monthly multiple. So from 20x to 48, 50x. Yeah. Um, it just depends on the monetization, the seasonality, um, how it was built. Um, we look for a lot of different factors, probably 10 to 15 different factors. So yeah. um, that's kind of a short answer there. Um, it becomes tricky if your site isn't really monetized mm -hmm. because then that's it's a question. Point. It's like, um, am I just buying the content? Mm -hmm. And then I have to look at the quality of the content. Um, do I think it's going to work? And because now it's riskier, because I, it doesn't have a track record of income, um, I'm probably going to give you a lower multiple of what I think it's probably going to earn, because right. it's not earning it yet. Yep. There's there's all those factors. Yep. But um, again, take that monthly profit, so what it earns minus what it costs. Your cost is probably very low. Yep. Um, but usually um, for those higher multiples, you know, 40x or so, uh, people want to see 12 months of history, because yep. they want to be able to take into account seasonality. If you don't have 12 months or if you've been ramping up quickly and 12 months looks bad compared to now, then hold it for a mm -hmm. while um, if you're considering selling it. Yeah. Let it, you know, work on making it, making the income on it just passive. Um, cut your cost to bare minimum and just let it run. Yeah. And then you'll see what it's worth. Um, but actually, it used to be we'd see a lot of 30, 32. And now like 38 and 40 are mm -hmm. really, really common. Mm -hmm. People are seeing that it's worth a lot. Yes. Um, I saw a comment up here from Jim, the, uh, Ricky, they said, looking forward to seeing you at the affiliate gathering yeah. next year. That's an exciting one. Um, another question that I saw, it, it already scrolled up, but it basically was, how can I write better? Um, well, there's a lot to it. Um, yeah. But a couple of little tips that I have, I work with a lot of our writers um, to write on our websites. And we tell them, do your research before you write. Um, spend research time outside of writing time and then write in a friendly manner um, friendly fr like in, in a way that you would speak to a friend right um, because that is easier to write it's easier to write that way and then break up your post into subheadings um, think of it as you know if you have five subheadings and you're gonna write 2,000 words or a thousand words break it up and do 200 word blog posts or 400 word blog posts inside a large blog post those little yeah. things right there, some little technical writing um, hacks, those work super, super well. Um, a couple of people have said I sound loud and Nathan sounds quieter. Mm. That's because I talk loud. I happen <laughs> to talk quiet sometimes. So, so we, will, we will try to <laughs> readjust. If I get a little quieter, then maybe like the stream will kind of pick it up. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, a couple of questions around monetization. What's a normal EPMV on a Zoic? This varies a ton mm -hmm. from niche to niche. Um, it varies with the content substantially. It also varies with how much traffic you have. So when you first sign up with Zoic or any like premium ad network, what's gonna happen is you're gonna earn a very low EPMV. You know, it might be anywhere from two to ten dollars per thousand mm -hmm. um, views, or which is what EPMV means, earnings per thousand views uh, or visits. And so you might find something in that two, seven, ten range. Uh, we find that over time, sites on a Zoic easily get up into the 20s and 30s and more, especially the more you take advantage of like video ads. Um, it depends on how many ad placements you have. But then, you know, how friendly is your niche and your content to advertisers? Yeah. Um, are advertisers going to want to associate their brand with your content? Um, is, it, is it a really like just audience friendly for for broad audiences is the topic something that's divisive at all 
that's going to cause a struggle. And also, it just you have to be willing to put in the effort. Zoic now has their levels. Mm -hmm. If you will take the time to go through and implement the things they say at each level and level up, then as you get more traffic on your site, um, the, the EPMV, not just the total earnings, but the EPMV will go up. Um, by the time you hit a level that you could go sign up for Mediavine, you can actually be earning just as high of EPMVs on uh, Zoic as you could over there, but only if you're going to take the time to learn the system, um, because up until then on Zoic, you're kind of mm -hmm. having to do it yourself, mm -hmm. uh, which is the only way that they're, by the way, able right. to uh, help brand new websites mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Yeah, um, uh, one question or quite a few questions or comments that I've seen here are about uh, the recent algorithm updates. Uh, that's something that's on our radar. Yep. Um, we're still looking into all of that. Uh, we don't want to make any comments or calls too early because sometimes it just needs time to settle out. Yeah, um, usually when there's a new algorithm update, it's like, give it two weeks. Mm -hmm. So for the first couple of days, Project 24 members, most people were saying, eh, I'm not seeing anything. Mm -hmm. um, then after a couple of days, a few of them were like, whoa, 20%, 30% yep. drop. Yep. Well, okay, but a one day 20% drop on a lot of sites looks not that different from normal variability. Yep. Um, and so it's like, okay, now we got to let it play out. Um, some of the websites that track like literally millions of searches to just kind of see how the domains are, are changing, how the rankings, how the SERPs are changing, um, we're showing um, high amounts of change, fairly high volatility for a couple of days right, after, right as it started to roll out. Um, we've seen that kind of level off. I showed you the Mozcast mm -hmm. earlier. I like the Mozcast. It'll show you that temperature. And, you know, we saw it as the temperature rises. What that means is there's just more volatility in the SERPs. Things are shifting. Um, but it takes a couple of weeks to kind of figure out, okay, what really changed? Um, our sites, like legitimately, yeah. if you look at the analytics, I can't tell. There yeah. was a core update. Just yep. can't even tell. Um, yes, and uh, Akil says Amazon is the biggest winner for this update. Actually, um, large retail sites. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I just said like tinfoil hat <laughs> time again, right? No, but um, we, we did see, at least for right now, uh, I have to wonder though, how much of that is just a shift in searcher behavior? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, like, there are a right lot now. Of... It's like Black Friday right. is literally right. this week. People are right. shopping deals right now. Yep. So are large retail sites going to be popping up more? Of course, right? Because that's what people actually want to find. And if Google's doing their job, that's what they should be servicing. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really know. Um, latest Caleb says hello. Hello. Hi. I saw a question a minute ago. Uh, how's Jim doing? I actually talked to Jim on the phone yesterday. Um, we haven't talked in a little while. He's been really busy doing mm -hmm. his stuff. I've been, um, we've been obviously busy doing yeah. income school, um, but he, he's doing well. Uh, is is good to catch up with him and kind of see what he's up to. Um, he's living the, the the blogger life, which means he can dedicate some of his time to building up a very yeah. substantial blog. By the way, yeah. um, that's doing really really well. Um, but he's able to dedicate time to other projects and things that he wants to do with his mm -hmm. life. So he's not working every single day a 40 hour week right. on his blog anymore like we do here yep. <laughs> in Come School because we don't just have a blog, we run this whole thing. Okay? Yep. Blogging as a software engineer. Okay, here's, here's the thing, like uh, I get questions often like, you know, what should I do? Or, you know, can I blog as a this or as a that? I am a chemical engineer. Income School is not a chemical engineering no, blog. It's not. <laughs> I also have an MBA and frankly, like I teach a fraction of what business school teaches because I teach the stuff that's applicable to internet marketing. If your background's in software engineering, like that's actually really cool because you have a more technical, knowledgeable background um, than a lot of people. It's going to give you some, um, some good skills that a lot of us have to figure out when mm -hmm. it comes to the com to computers and the web, etc. Um, but that doesn't have to be your niche. So you can talk about programming, you can talk about software, etc. But you could also blog about pest control. You know, you can blog about whatever it is that you want to blog about. So find something that you can. If if writing about something in the software space would um, would be just drudgery for you, then don't mm -hmm. do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone here says, um, "Are you guys selling any sites soon?" We don't have actually any current like really really soon um, i think yeah. we'll have some in a, in a while we're working on quite a few um 
but yeah, I don't think I don't think right now that none that, that none of no, come to mind. No, um, really, like we we want to build up um, a portfolio of sites mm-hmm. that bring in a good, solid passive income. Yep. Also, um, a couple almost two years ago now, we sold all of our sites to start over. Yeah. And while that was cool because it kind of it forced us again to start from the beginning. <laughs> um, what that also did is it made it so we didn't have any large blogs right. to test things on. Right. Um, and when you can test on a site that already has a lot of traffic, you can get results very quickly and see the outcomes very quickly. And so um, anyway, I'd like to own several. So what we'll probably start doing is selling one or two over time and starting a new one to kind of replace mm-hmm. it rather than doing mm-hmm. a wholesale right. sale. Right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, does a free WordPress theme collect user data? It would depend on the theme. I've noticed, I don't know that I've ever come across a theme that um, is like collecting user data without you knowing it. Um, really, the only reason you're, you would collect user data is one, the comments are turned on, it's, it's gonna get their IP address and their yeah, email. Yeah. Like, that's it though. Um, <laughs> you know, with ads, they're gonna, to the extent possible, try to collect some user data to target ads, but of course things are changing there in the mm-hmm. ad space. Um, Google's changing the game there. I mean, so unless you're like, you have an email list where people are directly signing up or you're selling an info product and again, people are directly signing up, you're not collecting user data. Um, that might be something to look into with themes, but legally they, if someone's collecting user data on your website, they have to notif- they have to, you have to know that. So read through their terms, make, read through their privacy policy, make sure mm-hmm. um, that you know. But and then if they are, you better include that in your privacy yeah, policy. Definitely. Um, someone says, "What do you think? Does is the fishing niche profitable?" Uh, very shortly, I'd say yes. I'd say it is a. Pro- I know of quite a few examples of profitable fishing niches um, or blogs in the fishing niche. So yeah, great niche. Um, I saw the question: How would you incorporate original research in the tech mm. niche? Um, and I've, I've seen this question, so you may have asked this before, like in our community. Um, I think this applies, actually to me, it's one of the easiest ones. Um, if I'm doing tech, like any sort of tech reviews, like original research means getting my hands on a product. Mm. And that can be really hard with tech because you have a short window of time um, before like the tech's obsolete. And you're competing against people who get the tech early. <laughs> um, but if you don't do like not all tech is that way Mm -hmm. if you're doing iphones like forget it uh you you better get your hand on the phone early but if you're doing um audio gear well that doesn't change as much over time like you know um i did uh this isn't so much tech but i did um pellet grills a year and a half ago Mm -hmm. bought five of them well here i am a year and a half later and every one of those companies has put out a new model and they all say that they updated their uh pretty much all say that they updated their temperature controllers. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, but really, like, did they really change? Um, they're basically the same, like the models have updated, but the technology is the same. Um, and so do I have to buy all the new ones again this year if I want to make some Pellet Grill videos? Not necessarily. So um, anyway, like testing stuff, testing gear, uh, but also it's not just about reviewing the gear. If you have tech and you're just like, hey, I want to write an article about um, I saw an article about how much a particular tech thing, how much power it uses. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? You plug in a little like amp meter in the wall and then you plug the thing into that and it measures how many amps it's pulling. Mm-hmm. And the guy did that for like an hour and took readings every five minutes and just had the chart of how much power usage it had and was like, yeah, it used about this many watt mm-hmm. hours of power over an hour. Well, cool. That's a definitive answer to that question. It's right. not just a, well, I read the specs and it says it uses this. No, no. So if you're just like, hey, how much does this particular refrigerator use? How much power does it actually use? Well, okay. Yeah. I'm going yeah. to plug it into an amp meter. Yep. And that's like a $10 tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Julie here asks, how do you afford to personally review products from expensive niches? Um, or do you do that further in? I think that you could do it further in. You could do it at the beginning. I like to think of my websites, my projects as businesses. Yeah. Um, and if you think about it as a business, making some sort of upfront investment isn't that uncommon. And so if that's something you can do, that's a great way to invest in your business yeah. upfront. If you can get like the Pellet Grills video, um, if you can do that, then that's a great way to kickstart your business. However, if that's not something you can do, 
then yeah, you're just gonna have to push, push, push until you're actually making some revenue. Right. And then definitely be reinvesting what you're making back into uh, your project. Yeah, we talked about barriers to entry before. Mm -hmm. Like, if if you can set aside something to invest and somebody else either can't or won't, Mm -hmm. well, now they have another barrier to entry. Right. And so when, when we started Backfire, and this isn't about the topic of the channel, I know it's fine, but when we started Backfire, one of the first things that we did was we bought five hunting rifles. Yep. They were the least expensive ones we could find, basically. And we compared them side by side. And the channel got monetized within a month. Yep. People spend more than a year oftentimes trying to get their first thousand subscribers and getting monetized. Yeah. Yeah. We launch a, a series of videos reviewing five hunting rifles the five cheapest ones side by side and we're there yep. i mean just 10,000 subscribers within a month or two it was just crazy yep. that differentiates um you from other bloggers who just aren't willing to do the same yep. thing so if you can um it one option is to just build up your blog starting as inexpensive as you can or starting with things where you can do some original research without testing products Mm -hmm. um we've talked about pets and it's like what can i call a pet store and interview the person who works there that's the dog expert or the cat expert that's a good start walk into the pet store for heaven's sake and go ask them like which of these cats would you would you take home would Mm -hmm. you adopt and why you know that is a form of original research but then um you know take that a step further when you can Right. right um but the other option is like okay Maybe if blogging takes six months to a year before I'm really making any money that would that like make me want to tell my friends what I'm doing on the side. Like a lot of us are kind of embarrassed to say, yeah, I'm blogging on the side until all of a sudden we're making good money. Then we're like, yeah, I'm a blogger and it's awesome. Um, but anyway, like if that isn't going to work, if it's going to take too long to be able to do what's going to take make your blog take off, okay, that's fine. Do another side hustle in the short term that gives you immediate cash. It's not. There are a lot of side hustles that are not, in my mind, scalable. There's only so many lawns I can mow, right, in a mm-hmm. given week. Mm-hmm. But I get paid for mowing those lawns immediately. Right. And so go do the little side hustle for a couple of weeks, save up your money, and then go buy the stuff. Yeah. When Jim got into photography, he literally sold everything in his garage and bought a camera yeah. because he didn't have extra money. And he just bought his first DSLR camera and started learning how to take yep. pictures. That's something sometimes what you, what yeah. you got to do. Yep. Well, I don't know if we're going to be wrapping up here soon, but <laughs> probably in the next couple. But of yeah, minutes. next couple of minutes. But there was a couple. There, I've seen quite a few uh, questions about AI blog posts or AI writing. Um, we did a test on this. I think it was probably close to a year ago now. We tested a couple different ones. Um, it wasn't that great. No. Um, I think that it's something that could potentially be something interesting to follow. But from what we've seen, a human can just still write a better blog post than an AI can. Um, there's just a lot more that you can do personally um, with the topic and it might feel great to try and outsource it that way it might be feel cheap or um, like a cool hack but for now it's just not the same quality and so we don't use it and we don't recommend people use it um, so that's kind of where we are on yeah. that topic <clears throat> yeah uh, you can use it to take some shortcuts yeah we found um, <laughs> There go the lights again. We found that um, some, we got these like motion activated lights and if we don't move enough, they just turn off. Um, no, but we found that like, if you like coddle it and feed it, mm-hmm. it'll, it'll give you the next little bit. It might, it might um, give you some subheadings you hadn't thought of, but you can't just like have an AI write an article right. for you. So it, it can help, um, but I mean, how much time and effort and money are you putting into getting that help that you could just anyway it's not mm-hmm. there yet a um, couple of questions here how do you optimize for featured snippets we actually have like a whole course yeah. and it's not just a lesson like a course with multiple lessons in project 24 about all the different types of featured snippets and how to optimize content for each one but in short basically we're just giving the best answer in the best format that you can for search queries so in one article I might be writing content that really like there are a dozen searches mm. that should maybe land on that article. Well, within that article, as many of those searches as I can think of, I'm going to write a one paragraph answer, about 300 characters 
that definitively answers the question in more encyclopedic mm -hmm. um, style rather than kind of the more friendly style. Um, there's some other nuances to exactly how to do that, but basically that's what it is. Sometimes the best format is a list. That's fine, right? It is a list or each of the items in the list can be the subheadings of your article. If the entire article is the list, mm -hmm. um, that works really well too. Google can pick that up. If it should be a table, make it a table, etc. And Google will even take certain rows and columns from the table right. and condense it down right. and make a snippet. So um, yeah. And then what is the best tool for optimized featured snippet keywords? I, I don't think there's a best. Um, frankly, again, I'm back to looking for um, search queries. Some of the, key, the keyword research tools do a decent job of identifying search queries. Mm -hmm. um, the search volume numbers they give are still very off. They're getting better, um, particularly Ahrefs, in part because they have a free version now and they get you to install it on your website. And so now awesome they idea. know all of your search volume. You connect it to Search Console and you're feeding their mm -hmm. data set, which I'm okay with that actually. Right. Right. Um, they provide you a free resource and in return you provide them with data that makes their tool better. Yeah. Um, but that's why Ahrefs is actually getting better at it. Most everybody is using Clickstream data, which is just a survey. It's a subset of data from the web. And um, search queries that are searched less often which are the longer tail keywords that we should be going for, um, their data is gonna be least, the least um, accurate in a survey. Yeah. And so it, it's just not that good. And so anyway, the idea here is we're looking for search queries that people are actually searching. The volume of each one I care less about. And so really what I'm looking for is, what are people actually searching? Right. It's not that hard to write one paragraph, yeah. right? And so even if the search volume is 50, like, okay, I'm going to include it in an article. Yeah. Yep. I, I give long answers. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, Carl. I, I appreciate it. Um, Carl Broadbent, nice guy um, here in the, in the live. Um, he has his own YouTube channel as well. Um, and uh, anyway, great guy. He's, uh, he's the one who's hosting, putting mm -hmm. on the affiliate gathering in the yes. UK and York. Um, if you're anywhere around there or can get to anywhere around there in May, we do have um, an aff affiliate marketing event. Um, affiliate marketing is a piece of what we do at Income School, uh, but really like everybody that's there, it's a piece of what they do. Yeah. Almost everybody there's yeah. using ads, etc., to monetize their blogs. And yeah. so um, got a good lineup of speakers and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke asks, how long can you leave a blog to marinate in the SERPs before adding new content? Um, well, I think a lot of times we or our or Project 24 members will write a good batch of content in the beginning. Um, we never really tell you to stop. Um, yeah. It's always maybe slow down a little bit once you hit 30, 40, 50 articles, maybe slow down to one or two a week if you have to. Um, but other than that, I don't think I would stop. I would yeah. always be dripping content onto the site. Um, if you're wanting to take a break, if you just need a break for a week or two weeks or a month, that's probably not going to hurt it. No. As long as your content is pretty evergreen, if you're a news site or something, yeah, you're kind of be on that content treadmill. But other than that, um, I would just drip a few articles a week, um, keep your search analysis up so that you can always have fresh content hitting. Um, yep. I think that's probably the best way to do it. There's a question here about using podcasts as a medium mm. with your blog. Uh -huh. um, I love podcasts. In fact, um, podcasting is something that I think we'll probably start talking about more. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty with podcasts is it's not a great... Um, it's, there's not a great place for people to just find you. Right. Um, but it's a fantastic place to get your message out, especially if you're, you know, YouTube isn't quite your thing yet. You're, you're nervous about that, but I can maybe do audio. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's fine. Start with the blog, add your podcast on there. Just know that unlike YouTube, it's not really going to get spread mm -hmm. the same way. And so you're going to need to go be interviewed on other people's podcasts, which means you need to interview them and vice versa. You got to do a little more work to get found, but the followership that you get with a podcast is a lot more like what you get on YouTube. But I also, what I like about it is you kind of have their ear for a longer time. Like right. you can share a lot more in a podcast. Right. So um, I really like that. Uh, Swing for the ring says, I'm here for the free Thai curry. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, someone asked any chance of Jim doing an update on the backfire blog. I think at some point we'll get him on here to do that. I'd love to see 
Um, love to talk with oh, him yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, another uh, learners asks, how do you start from scratch? We will soon be doing a new webinar, um, very like in-depth video. Um, just like, so yesterday on Channel Makers, on that YouTube channel, Nate did a walkthrough of the new YouTube system, just kind of showing start to finish, this is how I would build a new channel. Yeah. And we're gonna be doing the same thing on Income School for a blog, talking about some of the different kind of paths you can take. Um, as well as just the steps from the very beginning. Yep. Um, so keep um, keep your eye out for that. Okay, we should probably take like, well, let's each take okay, one more. Okay, let's each take one more. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll take, how do you manage running multiple blogs at a time? I'm running three and find it difficult on just, difficult just one man. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, uh, it, so. yeah it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I think that having some amount of the work outsourced can definitely help. Um, whether that's you hire a writer, or if you have someone to help you edit, or you have someone to help with some aspect of the work, that's really the only way that we can do it. Obviously, we could not yeah. write content for 20 or 30 or 40 websites. That's just not realistic. Um, and so really just have to find out the balance. You know, Could you be doing one site better than you could be doing five sites? You know, If you put all your focus on one site, would it be more valuable in the long run to just have total focus there? Um, and sometimes that is the case. Um, especially if you struggle with um, delegating some of the work. Um, but there's a lot of value to having a, a portfolio to kind of um, minimize your risk on one site. Yeah. Um, but it is a lot of work, you know, uh, keeping up with the content, keeping up with the monetization, um, making sure your links are all organized, all of those, your Amazon <laughs> links, and, you know, it, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so how do we do it? Um, probably not as good as we should. Yeah, um, even but, with a team. But it is something that it's it's worth doing to diversify. And I think along those lines, like having a system yes. for everything. Yes. And so like, okay, I want to do a good job of an internal linking strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. You need a system for that. If yep. you have multiple blogs, like, you know, I need all the articles on the website I need to structure them so that I know like what goes yeah. with what. So when I write a new blog post, not only do I interlink out to other articles, but I link from some of those to this one right. as appropriate, etc. Right. So you need a system for that. If you have a system, you can hand it off to a virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and then my last question <laughs> that I'm going to take was, um, I lost it here. Oh, it was about email lists. I don't think we talk about this enough, um, frankly, because again, that's another one of the things we should be doing mm. more of and better at. Yeah. But this is a great question. How do you manage an email list when your, your site covers multiple kind of related topics? Um, I think, you know, on income school, we have people that come to income school to learn about YouTube. Mm -hmm. We have people that we have content about podcasting. We not enough. Again, uh, we have content about email lists. We have content about blogging, starting a blog in WordPress, but also affiliate marketing. I mean, there's, there are a lot of categories yeah. of content that people come to us for. So what do you do? Well, I think you, we all need to get better at tags. So within your email list provider, you should have a way to tag different users. Yeah. Um, and so what you do is you create an email signup form that you put in different places. So if I have a blog post that's about podcasting, then you know what I'll do is I'll have somewhere in the blog post, if, I'm, if I want people to sign up for the email, instead of just having it in the sidebar or a pop-up, which is really bad for SEO, by the way, and user experience, you don't really want that, even though they convert well, mm -hmm. they're probably harming your traffic. Yeah. Um, that's a whole nother whole point. Nother topic. Um, <laughs> but, but somewhere contextually, I'm going to give people a reason to want to sign up, but I'm also going to make it clear that like, Hey, if you put your name here and give me your email address, you're going to get relevant content about mm -hmm. podcasting. This is the topic of this post podcasting. And maybe, you know, I have some sort of simple lead magnet to get them to want to sign up for that list. And then now when they sign up, they are just, they're put on my normal email list, but they're tagged with yeah. the tag podcasting. And so yeah. then when I go, want to send out an email that's about podcasting, fantastic. They, like, I just only send it to people with that tag. What if I want to send out an email that's more generally just about internet marketing? Yeah. Well, then I send it to everyone. And so we just need to get better at being smart about our list. You don't need a super expensive email provider to do tags and to, you know, this can be done. Um, we, if you want to see who we recommend, we have a couple recommendations at incomeschool.com slash tools, um, where you can see who we recommend, who we use, uh, send in blue is still mm -hmm. pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. You can get started for free convert kit who we're using for income school. Um, I 
also has a free level. Yeah. You sign up and until you have some email, some actual subscribers, um, yeah. a few hundred at least, you're going to be able to do it for free. Yep. Okay, I, 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 okay. Sorry, no, I have go one for more it. thing to say, but I want to say right <laughs> at the end here. Um, so we've talked about a lot of different courses today that we have. We just we announced the new uh, YouTube system launch, our affiliate si our course. Um, we have stuff on podcasting, everything. Frankly, if you've been struggling with this at all for a while and want to make it work, yeah. us making a living, like for me to make a living, um, I don't feel good about it unless I'm actually giving people value. Yeah. I don't feel good about just like, collecting money mm -hmm. from the internet um, because I know that that's not from the internet. I know that's from actual people. Yeah. And so Nate and I talk all the time. We talk all the time and it's just like, nope, if we're going to do something, it's going to be done yep. right. And we're going to help people. And what project 24 is all about is helping you to get to success, helping you make money from the internet, yep. um, create things of value and um, be able to use that to earn yep. a living. So go check that yep. out. That's it. That's it. <laughs> See you guys later. We'll see ya. <laughs>